Thank you. Um, I know all of you are very eager to leave this room and check out all these amazing sites. Just by a show of hands, how many of you know what codes of conduct are or you've heard about them? And how many of you think they are a problem and shouldn't be there? Okay, well, we are here to talk a little bit about what my work is. It's not going to be only about the work I've done with the Colonel, but it's about various communities. I am the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center. I am a lawyer who's represented most of the world's prominent open source software projects. And uh, here we are to talk about what is special about these codes and why they exist and why they are not such a problem. But if you do have objections, I'm happy to discuss, and that's what we will be doing. Um, we all know that a fundamental change is happening in the way software is made in the free and open source software communities in this century. Your communities are now mature, and the people who work there, which is you, understand your workplace differently. Over a decade and a half, what has happened is that more and more companies now employ developers to contribute to FOSS. And the communities have become diverse, and different expectations have begun to emerge from all stakeholders. These global communities, like the one present in this room, have narrower social interactions. Um, say, around a water cooler or in person. Therefore, putting a premium on the way your internal intermediated communication is conducted becomes necessary. In this talk, we will examine why codes of conduct in this new world are on the rise and actually are a positive sign for mature FOSS projects that govern themselves and don't like people like me, who are lawyers or the ones who wear suits. Later also, we will explore ways of managing legal risk by drafting codes of conduct that address bias, create a fictionless reporting mechanism for any legal incident response, and making the project at least a more inclusive, productive place for everyone. Now, this first slide, as you see, talks about the issues which are, per which are particular to FOSS communities. Usually what has happened is, and this is not just FOSS, but a lot of technical communities, there is a little lack of diversity in the talent that works here. I'm not saying that things haven't improved, but we have a long way to go. There is a lack of structure and rules which in the FOSS communities have historically been viewed as cultural benefit. There are factors that may disparately affect minority groups. There are time demands. There's work without pay, because a lot of software does get developed as volunteer work. There is a lot of premium which is put on personal reputation, which is highly prized, and who you know matters, which reinforces the homogeneity of the culture that exists in these communities. Now, does it really matter that all this exists if you agree those problems do exist? Does, if, if it does matter, then why does it matter? By now, most of us have read the widely circulated HBR article on the diversity dividend. If you haven't, obviously it's readily available, um, and you can just Google it. Now, it does say that diverse teams achieve better performances. And uh, a little fact in our community that venture capital firms that increased their proportion of female partner hires by 10% saw on an average a 1.5% spike in overall fund returns each year and had 9.7% more profitable exits. This is an impressive figure, given that only 28.8% of all VC investments have a profitable exit. Now, this also matters because if you have diverse teams, then you can actually build fairer products. And your products are now reaching everywhere to everyone and are running the world. Now, FOSS does also have a great potential to allow minority groups 
to succeed and provide an opportunity to succeed. Because there are free tools, there is meritocracy, that also makes it very special and easy for people who generally haven't had a chance to succeed an opportunity. Now, why codes of conduct? The codes of conduct are nothing to be afraid of and great for people who make software. The first reason, the projects now have become the workplace for many of you. Many of the free software programmers, your primary environment in which work gets done is the project. It may not be where the paycheck comes from. A lot of fast development is volunteer work, but it's also true that a lot of companies now pay programmers to work on free software. And these companies tend to be relatively sophisticated, large technology organizations that are investing in FOSS because it's good for their business and they have rules of the workplace. Standards and all that sort of stuff of their own. But the programmers who do work are trying to deal with the conditions of work in their real workplace, which is your respective project and not those companies. We just thanked a lot of sponsors and these sponsors also sponsor development. And recent entrant to the, to the game, Microsoft. If you see Microsoft's open source code of conduct, it reflects exactly that. All Microsoft employees, as Microsoft says, enjoy a safe work environment and a culture of mutual respect and responsibility. They say that our team members and open source partners should enjoy the same environment when collaborating on open source projects. And that is why they insist on these codes of conduct. Now, what these codes of conduct represent is the effort, is the effort by the community at industrial democracy, or if you want to say it, contributors' self-governance in the real workplace, which is the project. And what is happening is the amaturation of the contributors' desire for humane conditions of work. The projects have now evolved to a much more sophisticated workplace. This is not being done through adversary bargaining or collective union-managed bargaining or in any other ways in which employment law is traditionally made. It's being done in your style, like free software style of development, which is of open collaboration among the contributors themselves. This is a very positive maturing step in the process which should be greeted as an opportunity for everybody who works in the project space in large, international, cross-cultural collaboration to evolve the rules of the workplace that suit everybody's needs. This is the form of industrial democracy appropriate to the programmers working in the collaboration of free software in the 21st century. It involves making rules for the workplace, not in national legislature of your own countries, and not through adversarial bargaining with the employer who pays the rent, but in the form of free legislation that you write, you develop, and you also make the rules for enforcement. Now, and it is, op it is made through consent and operated through their own evolved processes. Listening. What is crucial to helping contributors such as you achieve what you're looking for is listening to you. Listen to the contributors, to the developers or workers. Yours is not a top-down system, it's a bottom-up system. And the lawyers, governance authorities who are helping to bring this system into existence are primarily engaged in listening. That's what my job is. Sometimes I am just billing only to listen to other people. Part of the reason that this is so important is that people need to be heard in the free software workplace. Because without voice, there is no adequacy of participation to cause people to come together and do the work you do. You do this work so that you can talk to one another. 
Mostly, of course, you converse in code, which is an important language and social structure for all of you. The program itself, but the program itself is not everything. For a while, when the workplace of the project was comparatively homogeneous, comparatively socially, culturally, ethnically homogeneous, and largely consisting of people of similar age doing work together as they were beginning in this industry, this was fine. During that period, it seemed like that listening could occur only through code, which you wrote. And really, what you needed to do the work after Linus invented Git was Git, a mailing list, and some kind of a bug tracker. And that worked very well for a lot of people. But it doesn't scale. And it doesn't scale across all of the humanity. And the process of listening is very much more socially complex because the organization of your communities has become very different. So what is happening now is that people are learning how to listen to one another differently. Some people are responding to this with great eagerness. They want to help their communities. They want to help their communities construct ways to listen to one another better, to collaborate better. Some people think the old ways of listening were good enough because indeed they worked very well for them. But slowly and with very great significance, with real meaning, people are learning to come together in order to change the way they communicate to make the workplace more humane and productive for everybody. There is pushback. Of course there is pushback. There ought to be. And there are people who think that this is somehow aimed in a hostile way at the way they communicate. Because the growth and diversification of your project implies change. But there isn't any intrinsic tension between the ways of communicating that worked before and the ways of communicating that will work better now. And I'm not just making these rhetorical statements, having worked with a very, very large variety of free software projects, as well as the commercial sponsors of these projects. That's the only gist of the learning I've had about different ways of communicating with each other so that your eyes stay on the prize, which is making great software. Now, the primary role of the professionals, particularly the lawyers or the governance people who come in, working in this area, again, is not to take the center stage and play a very active role. Our primary role here is to make sure that everybody understands that there is no conflict between fairness and kindness. You can be fair, you can be just, but you can also be kind to the people you work with, especially when those people come from different cultures, different nationalities, different understandings, different genders, and various other ways that they define themselves, not the way we understand them. So our primary role is to make people understand that there is no conflict between fairness and kindness, that the rules that we all are evolving for the workplace, that is your project where you spend most of your time, and for the community's interactions, do not balance our kindness to one another off against our justice or the sense of fairness to one another. These rules are geared to the achievement of both of these. In the same way that I'm going to take, and perhaps an unpopular example, but in the same way, unions of contributors are designed not to create an illegitimate power, though obviously all power can be abused, but to give contributors a form of self-expression and self-determination that is both individual and collective, and which provides both justice for contributors overall and fairness and kindness and mutual support amongst yourselves. And what does it actually mean into practice? Nations write constitutions, then they write laws, then they write other stuff. Companies write policies, because there's an employer-employee relationship and there's bargaining there. What do projects do? Projects write their own ways of governing themselves. And now they write 
they used to, uh, they, now they write code of conduct. It could be called something else, but that's what is becoming now. Now, adopting and writing a code of conduct firstly means that having a clear and accessible document which just states the norms under which projects operate. Now, this will only help you address any issues that may arise. One thinks that there aren't any issues, but most often what happens is that you aren't ready when the issues actually arise, and then there is public backlash, then there are other issues which come up. Now, an issue resolution process for addressing the cases where these norms are not being maintained is an essential part of such code of conduct. And as I said, we are not here, or anyone is not here to force anything upon the communities. It's mostly to understand how is it that you want to work with each other? What are your rules? And that's why when you, s the general principle is, why don't you state the purpose of what the code of conduct will be? Why don't you identify the specific expectations of behavior towards each other? How do you want to be treated, and how do you want others to be treated in this project? What is your vision for the project, other than just making a great, making great product? Now, it's very important to define the scope of the code of conduct. Does it apply to all your interactions? Does it apply only to conferences? We all know that conferences are an, are an integral part of how your community interacts with each other. You all have spent a week here because you think there's real value in getting together and working together and meeting in person as and when it is possible. So does your code of conduct apply to these conferences, only to the conferences, or to all kind of interactions? To your mailing list, to when you talk on phone, when you get onto IRC chats, or whatever is your mode or preferred mode of communication. So identify the scope. Set expectations by publishing reasons. If a, if a committee is defining a code of conduct, you also owe it to each other why you are saying certain things. Because as we all know, this is not a top-down system, but a bottom-up approach. And, all of, and everything happens when everybody collaborates with each other. So set expectations, publish reasons, have discussions. And at a conference, if you are there, promulgate code of conduct at time of registration, the talk submissions, and at the conference itself. Be clear that code of conduct covers official, unofficial conference, conference events, and what is the enforcement process at such conferences or whenever an issue arises. Do not adopt consequences of violating the policies that you wouldn't be willing to impose on your highest profile attendee. We all know that there are superstars everywhere, but that superstar status should not get anybody a free pass that's how we make fair policies. So you'll have to outline the reporting enforcement mechanisms, identify specific persons or titles to handle problems, and ensure that there is, a clear per that there is an identified personality to whom complaints can be taken to. If you want models, these are some of the models or templates people have adopted. You don't have to adopt them all in entirety. Each project adopt something which is specific to them. And you can all have opinions about all of these, and you are entitled to, but at the end of it, whatever is your project, whoever are the members of your community are the ones who will decide what you want the rules to be. There's geek feminism, there's a contributor covenant, there are popular projects like the One Linux Foundation now has adopted, the companies, Twitter, Ubuntu, Microsoft, Facebook, everybody's open source projects have their own code of conduct, and you can decide what you want from that. As I was earlier stressing upon, then an issue resolution process is very, very important. You will have and follow a written resolution process. If you do have one, then stick to your guns. Enforce the written policy. It is critical that everyone in the communities be aware of what the code is and what the process is. For that reason, most projects link to the code of conduct in the readme or a contrib files using a markdown language. There are common pitfalls. 
And we're not going to cover everything today here, but some of that which I often see is inconsistent enforcement of what is written. You write something, you don't enforce it, people just lose trust in the process. It's not very complicated, it doesn't have a lot of legal jargon. We don't encourage projects to actually adopt stuff which other people cannot understand or you need a law degree to even decipher. We're not writing privacy policies for social media companies. We're writing something which you all can understand. So inconsistent enforcement, a not clear issue resolution process. If the issues are reported, there's no acknowledgement. There's no assignment to who's going to be resolving it. And there's no in-time resolution. There's also a risk that code of conduct is seen as politicizing open source. Those who see it as an attack on meritocracy of coding. Those who see that this turns somehow everybody and turn the project over to social justice warriors. Nobody's interested in that. Nobody's attacking. The only thing which people are asking is, we all work together. Why don't we just have certain rules about how we talk to each other, how we interact with each other, and if one of us is not following those rules, then how do we deal with such an issue? It's your problem, so your solutions are the ones which work best. You only get professional help to make sure that at least you're in compliance with whatever your legal obligations are, or in order for you to have a streamlined process which makes it simpler and easier and rely on someone else's experience to build something which will work. Now, in my experience helping communities to do this thing, people's fear and fear of the new form of this democratic self-governance is a barrier to progress. The actual work of building these processes inside free software projects is most difficult. Having worked with large and significant projects that are techni technically and socially very sophisticated. The most difficult part of this is getting the steering committee or the project leaders or whoever you have in a particular project to actually make decisions. And the reason this is so difficult is precisely this feeling that it's about social conflict or social justice warriors, or whatever you want to call them, which is making people who need to provide leadership more timid and not be able to actually do what they're, what they're supposed to be doing. This is a statement from a project I have worked with. If some of you recognize it, um, it's this small project called the Linux Kernel. They now have a code of conduct. This is the reason they actually came up with why they are doing so. And this is an example of actually a really important project in which leaders realized what needs to be done. They are changing their behaviors, and they're really leading. They're not dictating. They're not throwing people out. They're not doing anything that their members are afraid of. They're saying we want to have a better workplace, and we're all going to work together to make a better workplace, and we are all going to make decisions in the same way we want our workplace to make decisions better for everybody. And this is the spirit in which we should all be engaging, not to see this as an occasion of tension among contributors, but to see this as a growth and further matur maturation of the way that programmers around the world contribute to this particular project. Having discussed all of this, I don't think there's m anything more useful to say about this than was said by this Democrat, if you do follow US politics, um, who was a great believer in self-determination, Franklin D. Roosevelt, when he said that you have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's why a lot of processes around the codes of conduct do get impeded and have obstacles which pe because people are very fearful of approaching this very subject, which is so much under their own control. Now, if you do face such a way, uh, or you're facing such a problem where you think that people are so fearful and your own leaders are not going to be doing what they think they, they are expected to for any reason, that's the time when you call in some other people from outside and help you work along with your community. Obviously, this is a plug, 
this is my name, and these are my email addresses. This is what I do is for, uh, for my profession to make my money. Or um, if you have any other free and open source software related questions, this is where you write. But all I will say is that codes of conduct are what you decide and what you enforce. And because diversity in your teams is better and also helps make more fairer products, then don't fear. Just get in, dive into it, and you will come up with something which is going to work for everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mishy. Got everything you can take it. Okay. Yeah.